the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Lord, we thank you for our gathering today. Thank you for you have been with us. Thank you for the thanksgiving, for the heart of thanksgiving that you have given us. Thank you for all the good things you have blessed us with. Lord, we thank you. We pray today that you, I, I pray that you speak through me. These are your people and this is your word. Oh, Lord God, you will speak your word in season to every year, every year that is seated right here. Father, we pray at the end of today, you will take all the glory. You will take preeminence. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. Okay, so I want to thank the set man, Pastor Timmy Okwelami, for this opportunity. You know, while he was appreciating everyone, I was just thinking within me that no one is appreciating our, you know, lead pastor, the set man over this house. And you agree with me, you know, he's doing so many things beyond ministry. You know, the way he thinks, he's looking at everything. I, I just wonder how he does all these things. I want us to rise on our feet and honor him this morning. Let us say we love you. We really, really do. We appreciate you. We thank you for, for your labor over us. And um, I pray that you will see the fruits and you'll be encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And if you choose to stand with me. <laughs> You are welcome. Nobody will look at you in a strange way. All right. So today is our Thanksgiving, you know, Sunday. We are back here to thank God. Really, God has been good to us in this house. You agree with me, right? Okay, so I'm going to be calling some things. If you know that, you know, it speaks to you, just wave your hands on, as you are seated. Just be waving your hand. You know, marriages. If you are married, you know, got married this year, you moved houses, you got promotion, just waving your hands if that applies to you. You got promotion, you know, you became a parent, you know, you, you moved, you, you changed jobs, you, you did, you celebrated your birthday, you had wedding anniversary, you know, just, just wave your hands to God. We moved from GRA to this place. You know, God has been so good to out of Zion. And indeed, it has been great power, great grace all through the year. It's been great power, great grace. And you know, the best part of it is that we are saved. Can you, can you rejoice? Jump on your feet and rejoice for the salvation of your souls. For the salvation of your souls. Hallelujah. You know, so many times we look at the tangibles. Those are the things we usually just, okay, we count. When we say count your blessing, you are counting, okay, God did this. I had more money in my bank account. I started my business. My business expanded and all of that. You know, you know we'll see where um, the disciples of Jesus, the 72, they went out. You know, Jesus giving them the formula. Like when you go out, if they receive you, stay there, you know, heal the sick, tell them about the kingdom. And then they got back, they were so excited that, oh God, Baba, let me use them, Pastor Saro's language, Baba, ha. you know, spirits were subject to us and all of that. They, they were so excited, they were rejoicing. And you know what Jesus replied? He said, don't just rejoice in that. He said, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. You know, that is the reason, that should be the basis of your joy. Yes, we have come to give thanks, and it's biblical. You know, when we look at the story of the lepers, you know, that God healed, and he says, are you the only one, you know, where are the others? So God wants us to give thanks. God wants us to be grateful, wants us to show gratitude anytime he does something for us. But beyond that, our joy should not be based on those things. You know, those things are benefits. You know, our joy should be based on our salvation. That's why it is called the joy of your salvation. And that is why you can rejoice always again. You can rejoice. Because, you see, these things that we see that, you know, that are benefits, they are variables. They cannot be the basis of our joy. You know, we go through seasons in life. You agree with me? We go through seasons in life. So if our joy is based on, you know, part time, what we see or what we are benefiting, then you cannot, it cannot be constant. So the joy should be based on the fact that we are saved. And that is the only reason why everyone rejoices. In Luke um, chapter 15, verse 7, talking about that, you know, that 
Heaven rejoices when one man is saved. You know, it says there is more joy in heaven over one man that repents. So what he's saying is that than, than over the night night, you see, there's still joy over you that you are saved. But it's just saying there's more joy over the one man that repents. It's just like, you know, when we have first timers in church, the way we welcome first timers, you know, we go there, we, you know, give a handshake, a hug, and all of that. And then we also welcome the second timers. We are glad that they are coming back, right? It's just that the way we welcome first timers is kind of grand because that's the first time they will be coming to worship with us physically. So the same way, you know, heaven, heaven, they are still, heaven is still rejoicing over your soul. It's just saying that it, there is more joy in heaven for a sinner that has come to repentance. You know, and so that is why you also, you know, that is, should, should be the basis of your joy. And you can rejoice again for the salvation. And that is why you can rejoice always. You can rejoice always because it's not based on, on the good things. On the, you know, when, when God shakes body, all the things that we benefit as is, he, he, in fact, Apostle Paul, he says that, I pray that above all things, you know, that you be in health, that you prosper. And then your soul, you know, that your soul will prosper and you'll be in there. So God wants us to prosper. God wants us to be in health. God wants us to enjoy all the good things. He has given us all these things to enjoy freely. God has given us, but our joy should not be based on those things. You know, in, um, in um, 2 Corinthians 4, 18, he says that, you know, we look not onto things that are seen, but things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So that is, that is what, you know, we base our joy on, on things that are unseen, on salvation. Amen. Can someone rejoice again? Rejoice that you know Christ. Rejoice again. I say rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, so when you go through life, Bible says that in this life there is trouble. You will, it says that, you know, but it says cheer up. Why would you cheer up in the face of trouble? Because there's something you are looking at. There's something you are seeing, you know, and there's something that is, that is, um, keeping you stable, that, that is, you know, causing you to be stable, to be at peace, you know, and that is the joy of your salvation. Hallelujah. All right. So, um, that is um, appetizer. <laughs> Hallelujah. I need to keep my eyes on the time so that I would um, not spend so long here. So, yeah, so today we'll be talking about... <clears throat> Uh, we've been having a um, series, this series on shaking. We've had a lot of series this year. Can we just echo them from the beginning of the year? Can you remember sales and ships and sailors? Uh -huh. Making Jesus famous. We had epignosis. We have um, on shaking now. Then there was a time we had a break, like personal evangelism course, where we, you know, looked at that. You know, so we've had a lot of, we've had cocktail, we've had um, good buffet this year, you know, back to back to back. So if you have not been listening, you can, you can make it this, it's not your end of the year resolution, let's call it that, because it's not a new year yet. So to go to SoundCloud, we have all the messages there, and, you know, you could just be playing them, just remind yourself, you, you know, the best part is that because you have been in church, as you listen to those things, they come back to you. You know, Bible says the word I speak to you, they are spirit and life. We have spirit and life stored up in, in SoundCloud and, you know, in all the social media platforms. Please go there and feed your soul. Get yourself ready and prepared. Amen. Amen. So today, I will just still um, on the unshaking, on the, um, so on the series we are still taking. So I'll be talking about, my anchor scripture will be 1 Corinthians 15:58. Hallelujah. So why, when Pastor Timmy told me about today, he had, you know, Pastor Timmy, he just loves me. He gave me enough notice, actually. So I couldn't come up with any excuse like Moses. I wanted to have that mosaic response that Pastor Timmy now. Nah, the pastor, they are doing well. Let me just sit in my seat and just be getting blessed, you know. I knew that a day like this will come. And so when he just told me, I just smiled. I said, okay, the day has come finally. So I went to God. I said, God, these are your people. This is your word. <laughs> and you know when you want to talk to a congregation like this that have been fed with healthy meals, you can't just come and say anything. You know, you know they've been fed with, we've, been, we've been fed with sound doctrine. And so I just said, God, okay, so what do I, what do you have for your people? You know, I just, when I get to that state, I just, 
I'll just, I say, I'll just say, God help me. I usually, I literally, I always say it out. I'll say, God help me. And every single time I say, God help me, he has always come true for me. And he, you know, God does not have favorites. It's not like I'm his favorite too. So all he needs is for you to just acknowledge. He says that his strength is made perfect in your weakness. Just acknowledge that weakness and invite him. He will not just come. He's a gentleman. You know, you need to invite him into your affairs for him to, you know, to intervene. Because he's the, he's the Lord your God. He's not, he's not everybody's God. He's the Lord. Yeah, he's the Father. He's the Father of all spirits. All things, you know, come from him. Not who was made that, you know, without him. But he can only be your God when you invite him. He will not just, that's why he was the God of, you know, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Lord that. So it is, but he's the Lord of the earth. He's the Lord of all. But is he your God? Is he the Lord your God? Amen. Okay, so um, this is the verse that that came to my heart and i would like it to be projected thank you media first corinthians fifteen fifty-eight. he says therefore my beloved can we read it together we can all see it right okay so you can we can read it together want to go therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Again, let's say it again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, this is just so apt today that we are appreciating every single person that put in a lot of work, you know, this year, whether it's sacrifice, whether when, times when it has been convenient and times, times when it has not been, you know, Bible is encouraging your heart that, you know, you can just keep the scripture there, that be steadfast, immovable, abound in God's, abound in the work of God, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Bible, God has not called the house of Jacob to seek him in vain. And you know, when God, when God rewards you, it's not like the reward of man. You know, Bible says, when he was talking about, when God was telling Abraham, he says, I am your great and your exceedingly great reward. When God is your reward, you cannot quantify it. You cannot even, you just, you just, the reward is, will just, because he will reward you according to his riches in glory. That is how he rewards. Hallelujah. You know, like Pastor Timmy was saying that if we're to be given something, a gift, maximum, maybe a hundred thousand naira gift each person, you know, it would, over time, you would, you consume the gift and then you forget about it. You know, there have been times when workers in this, last year were giving gifts, right? How many of you still have the gift? The wristband, the bottles, some people don't even know where it is. You see, when God rewards you, you will see it, you will feel it. Hallelujah. You will, you will, ah, you, you will, you will leave that mark, you know, hallelujah. So, you know, God's reward is always what we seek to get. You know, uh, we've been looking at um, Genesis 49, 22, talking, um, so what is, when, when God says, when the word says that be steadfast, okay, you can leave it there, be steadfast, what does it mean? You know, I had this strong Bible that I bought a long time ago, so I just brought it out and dusted it, and then I said, okay, let me look at the root word of steadfast, is um, <clears throat> a Greek word that is pronounced as edrios, ed, edrajos, yes. So it means to be, to be settled, to be immovable. It's a derivative of ezoma, which, which means to sit. So it's saying that, to, you know, when you sit, like you're in the state of, you're not going anywhere. You just sit down there, yes. So that is, you know, where it's being steadfast. You are, you are not, you are unwavering, you are resolute, you are steady. So that is what God is saying. He says, be steadfast. Be steady, be resolute, be immovable, you know. And then, um, so back to, back to Genesis, you know, when the um, Bible says that Genesis 20, 49, our um, scripture 22, that Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well, his branches run over the wall. Next verse. The ashes have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength. Can you see that? He was tenacious. He was, he was immovable. He remained in strength. And that is why, you know, looking at the life of Joseph, too, you see all the seasons he passed through, you know, but he had a dream. And he held on to that, 
knowing that, you know, this dream is going to come to fulfillment. How many of us, the beginning of this year, God has spoken to you. You are sure that this is God's word to you. And then just because it's December and you have not seen the fulfillment of the word, are you still steadfast in that promise of God? Do you still know that or believe that he that has promised you is able to do it? You know, the Bible says that God does not lie. He's not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. If he has said it, he will do it. Are you steadfast of his promises? If you, if you don't hold on to the promise of God, you will not see it. If you are not steadfast, you will not see it come, you know, come to fulfillment. In James, the Bible says that if, if we must receive anything from God, you, you cannot be doubting. Because being doubting means that you are not steadfast. You are not, you are not resolute in, in, you know, in what God has said. Our journey as a believer, our faith journey, you know, has to do with you have to be steadfast. So many things will come, so many things will come at you, you know, because of the word. But you need to be steadfast. Look at the parable of the sower. You know, the word, when the sower was, you know, the, the, some of the seed dropped on the, on the rock. And because there was no soil, uh, you know, it sprang up. And then what happens when tribulation came and all of that, you know, it just had to. That's why God says we should be firmly rooted and grounded in the word. So that we don't be like you know, the ones that the word dropped on the rock and because there was no root and it just I just gave up. Tribulations came because of the word and you just give up. So you have to be to receive anything from God, to receive his promises. You know, you have to be steadfast, you have to be resolute. Bible says that his promises for us, they are what? Yes, yes and amen. So you, are, you know that these promises are sure. They are sure. So all you need to do is just stay on it. You know, make sure. You don't sweep it under the carpet like Pastor Timmy said. You don't just, oh, maybe God doesn't know. You need to stay there. You know, remember the widow that persisted. He persisted. Eventually, she got what she wanted. Not because the king liked her, but it was just time. Like, my woman, will come out. Me, let me just give you. You know, you have some people like that. Even our children, we do that. Sometimes, maybe when you are busy. They, they to the spots, they know those times when to come. When they know that you are busy, just mommy can we go have you go just go, you know. So you have to be persistent to receive from God, to receive the promises of God. I'm saying this because I know there are some people you look at this year from the beginning of this year, and some things that God told you in January, you are yet to see it in you know to manifest. So you need to be steadfast in prayer, in your faith, knowing that you know God that has said it does not lie, and you will see it, it will come, it will happen. You know, it will not tarry, it will happen. God is never slow because he created time itself. God is not bound by time. So if he has said it, it will happen. All he needs from you is that persistence, that steadfastness, that resolute, that, you know, staying, staying in the word, staying in faith and not doubting, not wavering, not wavering like, you know, like water that is just, you know, going to and fro like that. You know, Hebrews 6, 19 talks about the hope that we have in Christ is an anchor to our soul. And this hope is both steadfast and sure. There are so many character attributes of God that we see steadfastness. You see, God's love is steadfast. That's why they call it steadfast love. Uh, uh, is this love like, there, in fact, you see, for couples, for married couples, husband and wife, when you are saying your vow, after saying this, you say, what ends it till death do us part? You see, this love of God, death does not have anything on it to, you know? Let's look at Romans 8.35. What does it say? Please project it. You know, talking about the love of God. Let's see how far, how far this love can go. How steadfast this love is. Please, let's see it. And that is the love. We are not just saying something in theory. That is the love he has towards you. You can call your name that. That is the love God has towards. Can, you, can we do that exercise? That is the love God has towards Tolu Lokwe. Yes. So let's read, let's read the love that he has towards you. So it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or fame or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conqueror through him who loved us. For I am persuaded... Okay, let's read this together, please. It's very, very important. Can we all see it? Let's do one, two, go. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, 
nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. What a steadfast love the Father has towards us. What a love. He said, even death, this kind of love, eh, death cannot separate. Uh -uh. What kind of love? What manner of love is this? What manner of love that he has called us his son? He has adopted us. We are children of God. That is steadfast love. Okay, let's look at, that's one attribute of God. Look at mercy. God's mercy. He says the sure mercies of David, like the mercies of God towards you. It's just so sure. It's so steadfast, you know, and that is the attribute of God. You know, he's steadfast. Once, he, you know, he's focused on things. And that is why we have to be like our father. Because he's our father, right? You know, you're right. We say, Baba um, Nilomonjo, right? God is our father. And so we share the same attributes as God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bible says that the hope we have in God is both steadfast and is sure. You know, like, um, last time we were at um, Toby's wedding, and then he was talking about faith, hope, and love, and all of that. And then, you know, hope is the foundation of our faith, right? You know, what is faith? Faith is the substance, Hebrews 11, 1, substance of things hoped for, the evidence. So it's a substance of things. There has to be hope before faith can act, isn't it? You know, and then a lot of people don't like to hope. Someone like me, for example, I don't like to keep my hopes high because I, I don't like disappointment. So I would rather not hope so that I'm not disappointed and then I'm not in offense. Hallelujah. So I would not, I would not just hope, but you know, you can hope in God. Why? Because the hope we have in God, which is the anchor for our soul, is both steadfast. It's not just steadfast alone and it's sure. So you can hope in God. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid to hope in God. Man may, might have disappointed you several times and then, you know, the thing, the problem is that sometimes we our logic of, we, we like to put man and God side by side and we treat God like man. We, you don't treat God like man because he is God. God is not a type. He never ended. There's a song. He never ended. He never became God. He has always been God. Hallelujah. He has always been God. So don't use your man's, um, you know, logic or, or experience to judge God. No, God is faithful. And, you know, he says that the hope we have in Christ, you know, Christ in us is what? The hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. So the hope you have in God is an anchor to our soul, and it is both steadfast and sure. And that is why our faith can be built on that hope in God, because it is steady. It is immovable. Hallelujah. You know, Abraham, against all hope, he believed. He done, you know, some people say, you know, sometimes some people ask that, when you get to heaven, who would you like to see? Some say, I want to see Abraham. Like, how did you hold on for 25? Some people can hold on for 25 minutes, <laughs> you know? Like, God, what is happening? Some people this year, no, they can't hold on. Ah, you said this in January, this is December now, but what's happening? But, you know, they still believe God, uh, God of 11th hour, right? Yes, and he's still, he's still the God of 11th hour. Yeah, things, things can happen. Things can still happen, you know? But, he, against all hope, and the reason is not because God wanted to withhold this child from Abraham, but there was a process, there was, there is a state that God wants Abraham to be. So God is more interested in the process than what, he, because he knows that this Abraham is going to start a lineage, you know, of Christ. In Matthew 1, you know, when you start reading the genealogy of Christ, and then you see how, you know, from Isaac, Abraham begat, Isaac begat, for 40 48 generations. You know, this thing always just amazes me anytime I look at it. Like, some people think they love themselves. I just come together. You don't know that God, God is just putting people together, putting people until Christ. You know? And then you see, yeah, this one begat this, this one. And they, they were just doing mundane things. And maybe they just, they even get betrothed. You know, in those days, they don't have the opportunity of choosing their own spouse. They betrothed them to each other. And then in that, in that decision, God is there because there is something, he's crafting something now. 48 generations, can you beat that? How many of you have your two generations alive? Very few. 48, and God was, he made sure that, you know, his um, Isaac and um, Rebecca, and then his Jacob, and, you know, everything until Christ was born. You know, so God is steadfast. He's steadfast, and he wants us to be. That's why we're encouraged to also be steadfast and to be immovable. Amen. 
like I said, to receive anything from God, you have to be steadfast. Isaiah 26, 3 says that then um, God will keep in perfect peace those whose mind is stayed on him. What does it mean? See, the promise of peace is not just, yes, it's there. But if your mind is not steadfast on him, that peace may elude you. Hallelujah. So you need to be steadfast on him to, 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 you know, to receive the peace of God. You, know, you need to stay on him. You need to stay and be steadfast. You need to be steadfast. You know, I, I was reading um, when John the Baptist sent his disciple to meet Jesus. And they was like, are you the Messiah or are we to wait for? And then I, I, I looked at it. I, I did to John the Baptist that I'm missing. That is not the same person that baptized Jesus, that, you know, the voice came, that was even speaking of Jesus before he may make his, you know, make, make his path, make way make straight his path and all of that and then at some point he began to doubt ah, ah. so i said this thing is real low. if you don't if you are not steadfast and immovable you will the things you once hold true and there you will start doubting and that's why the bible says that you know we should we should um hold fast to the word so that we don't drift because you can drift things that had been once real to you you can start doubting at some point you know, maybe because John was in prison and then he just looked at his life. Whatever it is that inspired that doubt, somebody that you have handled this thing, you are even the one that baptized Jesus, you were there when, you know, the, uh, the voice came that this is my beloved son and all of that. And, you know, so really you need to be steadfast. You need to hold fast, you know, the confessions of your faith. Hallelujah. Now, you know, when... Um, when um, David, I think after the Bathsheba incident in um, <clears throat> Psalm 51, 10, he, you know, he prayed to God and said, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Yes, you know, that does not apply to us because it's not just creating you as a new heart. You are a new creature entirely. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5.17 helps us to understand that. It says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And it says renew, a, a, you know, the steadfast spirit within me. There is no, the Holy Spirit in you does not need renewal. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So, you know, you, all you need to do, and the Holy Spirit is steadfast. He's there. Even when you are, diso when you are not listening to instruction, it's just, it's just like a, sometimes a Google map. I know Google map can get a cane. It will beat some people. <laughs> In 100 meters, turn right. You say, no, you just go. <laughs> but, you know, it will just reroute you. Okay, you have missed this one. You know, go. So the Holy Spirit is steadfast. It's the spirit within us. All you need to do is call on him. And he's right there. He's right there. He's not just there for decoration. That is the treasure we have in our 18 verse. He's not just there for decoration. He's there. He's a wonderful counselor. He's there to comfort, to direct, to teach, to lead. He says, as many that are led by the spirit of God, they are sons of God. So he's there to lead you. He's there to lead. There, there should be nothing called confusion or that you're at a crossroad. There's nothing like that. You have the spirit of God. Engage the spirit of God within you. And then you know exactly what to do. He'll tell you which way to go. Hallelujah. You know, this life that we're... Why wouldn't he say rejoice because your name is written? I mean, it's just a full package. Hallelujah. It's a full package. And we can rejoice just because you are the son of God. Do you know so many things that come with it? You can rejoice at your status. Hallelujah. That is, your, that is who you are. Don't just rejoice in the tangible things. Rejoice at your status, you know, because of who you are. Not because of what he has given you. Rejoice because of who you are. And then seek to bring more people into the kingdom. He says, heaven rejoice. Don't you want heaven to rejoice? Yeah. Eh? So, you know, seek to bring souls to, you know, to respect and say, heaven rejoice over one soul. So, you can imagine you have like five souls. They enjoy in heaven. Eh? They will not be here. Oh. There will be party in heaven. Like, eh? Or oh, did the five? You know, when, when devil was cast down from heaven, he says that there is joy in heaven, Abby, and he says woe to the earth. So when you bring souls to Christ, one soul has escaped the woe. Hallelujah. There is joy in heaven, you know, when a man, you know, gives his life to Christ or when a man is saved. And so there is, there is um, and we want this joy. We want, the Bible says that he that wins soul is wise, you know. You want, you want, to, you want, you want people to enjoy what you are enjoying. You know, a lot of people say, like, it's as if we believers, you are in a bubble, like, 
you are just, you, you are not feeling the heat. And it's because of the Holy Spirit within you that enlarges your capacity, that just make a way where it seems to be things that people struggle to do. You just, do, you, you know, there's just this ease that, that you have. There's this rest of mind, like um, Toby that Pastor Timmy talked about, you know. You're just at ease that, you know, be, be, regardless of the troubles of this world, you are just cheerful. You are cheerful because of that stability that the Holy Spirit brings for you. You, you know, you are steadfast. You are immovable. You are immovable. Hallelujah. You are immovable. Amen. So if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, and don't be unstable like the water. You know, Bible, de- okay, back to Genesis 49. Let's look at when Jacob was blessing his children. Let's see what he said to Reuben. He says that unstable as water, you shall not excel, isn't it? So I looked at water. That, you know, water is really unstable. Is one substance that exists in three states, right? Solid, liquid, and gas. And a lot of us, I know women can relate with this, and maybe some men that help in the house, when you want to defrost your freezer, mm, you know, if you're not careful, the ice can even, you can get injured, right, in the process of doing that. You know, that's the same water that is, when it's in liquid and when it's gas that you cannot even figure out where it is, the same water. So, you know, when the heat of life comes, if you are not stable, you know, just apply heat to that ice, what happens? It turns to liquid. And the more heat, it becomes gas, you cannot, it becomes vapor. You cannot even spot it, right? So, you know, that's part of this why you need to be, you need to be steadfast. So for the, for the water to remain in that solid state, what happens? That means it has to be at a particular temperature, isn't it? So it has to be at a particular state. So for you to remain steadfast and immovable, you have to be at a particular, your spirit has to be at a particular state. Because the life has a way of adding heat. And if you are not in that, if you are not steadfast in that state, you will just melt, you will, you will fall like a pack of cards. Hallelujah. You will throw in the tower, you will cave in, you will deny God, and you will be asking that, is this life even true? Is it a scam and all of that? So you need to stay, that's why you need to be steadfast. You know, in your faith in God, in your work with God, so that you can maintain that state that God has placed you. Amen. Because life will, you know, life happens when um, the, two, the two houses that were built, storm came for both of them and all of that. So what made one stay is the, the solid foundation, right? And so that is why you need to be steadfast. Amen. 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 So, Bible, when, when John, um, Genesis, in Genesis, when um, Jacob was talking to Reuben, and says that, and he said that, don't, um, that, um, unstable as the water, you shall not excel, right? So, it's like, is it, um, stability is also tied to excellence. Now, you know that excellence is one of our core values in this church, right? Okay, so can we say that again, the, um, flat depth. Let's, let's say it again so that those that join us for the first time, they will be curious and want to know more about it. So let's chorus it. F, faith. faith okay. Love. Love. A, accountability. H, honor. D, discipline. E, excellence. And P, and we have joy. Joy. Flat depth. J, yes. So those are our core values in this church, you know. So um, excellence is one of them. And so to, be, to excel, you have to be stable, right? If you are wavering, even as a man, if you have somebody that, is, that, that you can't depend on, you don't, want to, you don't want to do business with such a man, isn't it? You'd rather go for somebody that you can depend on. So excellence, is also, there's also stability to excel. Hallelujah. There's stability to excel. And then the last part, it says that, Always abounding in God's word, God's work. And what is God's work? God's work is good work, isn't it? It says God is good. So God's work is good work. Amen. And then Ephesians 2, verse 10, talks about how God has... Okay, let's project it so that we can just look at it together. Ephesians 2, verse 10. It says that for... Let's read together, please. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God has created this good work. That is God's work. He says always abounding in, in God's work. You know, he has, created, he, has, he has created you for it. That means he has given you the capacity to be able to walk, you know, the work of God. Amen. So each and every one, we have that capacity. You know, God will not, 
God is not like man. You know, in secondary school, some seniors, he wants you to go and buy something and bring change without giving you money. <laughs> I mean, I went to body house. A lot of things happened in body house. I was in body house too. You know, they'll say, buy this, buy that, and then you're expecting money, and they want you to bring change. Ah, no, God is not like that. If he asks you to do something, know that he has already equipped you. You might even be unaware of that capacity, but no, just step out in faith. Step out, and then you will realize that, oh, God has really equipped you. I, I did not even know it. You know, he knows you. Before you were formed in your mother's room, he knows you more than you, so he's the one that will reveal you to you. So when he's saying do something, you know, he knows that you have the ability to do it because he, has, he put it there for you. He says he has prepared you. He says you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. He has prepared you for good works. So that's why the Bible can say always abound in God's work because he has given you that capacity to be able to do that. Amen. So God's work is also ministry work, right? He says that he has given us the ministry of reconciliation, right? So God's work is also ministry work. So when he's talking about God's work, it's not like you are going to heaven to do the work. The, the work is within here and outside, right? So in the capacity, the different capacity where we serve as workers, just put in your heart. You know, God is the designer of the thoughts and intention of man, uh, of the heart rather. Man looks at the outward appearance, isn't it? But God looks much within. So whatever it is that you are doing, don't just, don't let it become a, an activity. If what you are doing has become a cliche or an activity, you might need to just excuse yourself for some time and then introspect and come back, right? I'm talking as a worker. What, because your heart has to be there. You have to, it's, it's, it's your service to God and your heart needs to be there, not just doing it as an activity, knowing why you are doing it, knowing because of the love he has shown to you, this is just a little of an appreciation that you can do, you know, by being a responsible son, hallelujah, in his house. So, he says that um, Isaiah talks about um, that God has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, um, give liberty to the captive, and then sight to the blind. So those are part of the good works, right? Please, can, can we um, open to that? I think it's Isaiah 28, if I'm right. 61, sorry. Isaiah 61. God has anointed me. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's on the screen. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to those who are bound. So the gospel is not, is not just, uh, when, we, when the Bible talks about poor, it's not just like poor in monetary terms. You know, the Bible says in the uh, Beatitude, it says, blessed are the poor for there's the kingdom of God, right? You know, those that have not come to the light of the gospel, those are the people that the Bible referred to as poor. So it doesn't matter the amount, how much you are worth, your net worth and all that. If you have not come to the light of the gospel, you are still poor. So those are the people that, you know, it says that, to, you know, to, to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the broken hearted. Talking about comfort, you know, ministering comfort. And because that is, that's the uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter, Right. So heal the brokenhearted, liberty to the captive. That's um, to proclaim liberty to the captive. Now, when we talk about captive, um, you know, it's like you cannot go to a strong man's house and, you know, take his good without first binding the strong man, isn't it? So the strong man is the devil. And so he has held some people captive. So we have to, it's still this same gospel that would liberate them. Hallelujah. It's still the same gospel that will liberate them from the, from the holds of, and shackles of, of, you know, the devil. Because he is a defeated foe. But it's just that he's still deceiving people. He knows his time is short. You know, so he's still deceiving people. He's still, you know, going out there to, to deceive people. And that is why we need to, we need to make everyone rejoice by free, by, by letting people know what God has done for them. We are not bringing anything new. We are not doing anything new. It's just, it's just information. You know, say information is, is power, right? It's powerful. It's just information. My, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. So the, you need to bring this knowledge of what God has done, what Jesus Christ has done, the finished work of Christ, and all that he has done to people so that they know, and then they can come to the light of the gospel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then, um, so we talk about um, love language. 
So I know that for married people, they, talk, they say different things about love language, right? And my love language is gifts, my love language is this. <clears throat> so love, when we talk about language, it's not just something you speak, it's something you do, right? Action. They say love is a verb. It's a, so, you know, it's, how you, it's communication. So in going, to come, in going to bring souls to Christ, they have to be able to see that love language. They have to be able to, you have to be able to communicate love and not condemnation. You know, because they already feel condemned. You know, the devil is an accuser. You are, you, you are good for nothing. All the, look at your past. Look at, you think that is you, that God, look at everything that you have done. Even if God forgive you, can you forgive yourself? You know, he brings so many thoughts into the heart of people. But by communicating the love of God to them, and you can win them back to God, and you can, you know, win their souls. Hallelujah. So when we are, we have to be cautious of the, our, our language. is not just at our workplace. You know, sometimes it might be difficult to preach the gospel outrightly, but by the way you communicate love to people, you know, you can show them the way. Do you understand what I'm saying? And if you have the opportunity to actually be verbal, be vocal about it, then you do. But while you are seeking the opportunity, you know, you are communicating love, you are praying, your love work towards them. And have you met some people that... You are wondering, when you hear that they, they are Christians, you were surprised. I, I've, I've seen somebody in my, in my workplace, you know, when I heard that she was, I was like, it's a lie. I thought it's another religion because I look at how she communicates and it's not, it's not aligning with all this flat depth J that we talked about, <laughs> hallelujah. So, you know, so you should not be someone like that that is a Christian in church and then out there. Because out there is where we need people. Almost everybody in church that comes to church, most of the time, or a larger percentage are saved already, right? For you to even be bold enough to come to church and all that. Yeah, we have some people in church that might not be, have, you know, at some point, have not made that decision. But a larger percentage of people in church are already saved. So who are these people that we're talking about? They are the people in your workplace, in, in your sphere of influence, in other places outside the church. And that is why you must communicate this. But if you are just um, a Christian in, when you, on Sunday, then it's not, you, need to, you need to look at it again, that this is not how it should be. Amen. So you need to communicate, you know, give that love language, communicate the love of God to men. And through this love, they will come to know God. Amen. Amen. So finally, because of time, um, it says that your labor is not in vain. It says that your labor is not in vain. God rewards labor. <laughs> men sometimes don't reward labor. Men reward results. If they, you know, when you use this KPI for companies that you, maybe you get proposals, you have, you have like 10 proposals you are chasing, and you are unable to get the jobs in, it's as good as you didn't do anything. Even if you had sleepless nights preparing the proposal, doing all those things, they don't reward um, all your labor. They reward results, isn't it? But God rewards labor. Can you say that again? God rewards labor. God rewards labor. So you can, you can give it all. You, you know, you can't lose. Like, <laughs> you can give God your all, your services, your heart. Your, he's a rewarder. And you're not doing it because of the reward. But he will reward you anyways, you know. He, because that is who he is. He doesn't use people. He rewards, he rewards your labor. Because you are co- he himself, you are co-laborers with Christ. You know, let's look at Hebrews 6.10. As I um, try to round off, I think um, my time is up. Hebrews 6, 10. Okay. It says that, For God is not unjust to forget your labor. <laughs> it says, Even to forget is injustice to God. That I just, you know, sometimes forgetting is not, it's not like I intentionally forget. I just forgot. He says that if God, if me, God, if I forget, that means I'm unjust. He says God is not unjust to forget your labor and your work and labor of love, which you have sown towards his name. Can you see that? In that you have ministered to the saints, workers. Are you, are you listening to that? And do minister. God, will, he will not even forget. He doesn't have amnesia. He doesn't have short-term memory. You know, you know, or like men, sometimes when you, when you have done something for a man 10 years ago, and then you did not do something now, 
the man cannot remember what you did. There is the noun that you refer to that you did not. Maybe you come for you ask for help and he was unable to render that help. It is that um, that disappointment, that one time that he will likely remember. He will forget the the 99 times that you had come through. A lot of men, you, had, you know, you just have to be deliberate and intentional about it. So sometimes when things like that happen, I remember when this person had come through for me. So I don't, you know, but it's just, it's just typical of man. But God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints. You know, when we gather here and we are giving our services, different departments in the church, you are ministering to the saints and you do minister. He says that he is not unjust to forget. And he is not just to, it's not that he will just remember and just clap for you. He will reward you. Amen. He will reward you. You know, in, in kind and cash, he will reward you. He will reward you with sound health. He will reward you with prosperity. He will reward you with prosperity of your soul. He will reward you with great home. He will reward you. He will reward you. In fact, you cannot box, you cannot limit his reward. He is a rewarder. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So I just want to encourage you that to be steadfast. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 58. To be, as I close um, now, to be steadfast to be immovable, to always abound in God's word, knowing that, you know, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you.